asked the introductions to our members, Shannon Hudson and Vicki Hudson Reese. Mm -hmm. And they are talking to us about their book. And let's go ahead. Uh -oh. Well, it's like a great, okay, go ahead and talk about the history of the first section. No, the building. All right, so we actually have a presentation that's like an hour and a half long, and we knew y'all wasn't going to sit for that. <laughs> so the presentation we created is actually in three parts. The first one is just about the history of education of colored children and the buildings. The second section is about the faculty we were able to find, and the third section is on the students that we're able to find, two of whom are still living. And so this evening, we, were, we would like to introduce you to the history of education of colored children, how it related or how it happened in Civil War, and spoiler alert, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> Civil War, then up to the Lincoln Building, so we're gonna focus on Montgomery County, and then Lincoln then became a part of the Crawfordsville Parks and Rec Department, and was really a, a collection ground for those individuals who were colored or uh, marginalized, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. So, my dear, they are all yours. Okay. So, um, actually, um, the AME Church, which was established in 1847, uh, built a uh, colored church school because it, uh, there was no education for uh, the colored students. Can you use a microphone? Oh, I have a light. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can take it off of there. <laughs> okay. Because of the uh, laws that were being uh, passed at the time about the, the, the movement of the colored population, they had to be able to lead the books because if they didn't have a certain piece of paper, they could be sold down south. back down south, they could be arrested or at least their livelihood. So the AME uh, church was big in uh, education. And so they built schools all over where they had churches and educated both adults and children. After the Civil War, they still uh, when they, it was mandated that they had to educate the colored students, uh, that they didn't build the school, they just uh, give money for the, the colored, for the church to continue uh, in the school. And the school was also used during the uh, uh, Underground Railroad to hide escape slaves. Now, once, it, once the population got big enough, there were 126 students, and the place that they were renting was becoming unavailable. Um, they built the Lincoln's, Lincoln One. That was about 1881. But they still continue. Some still continue to go to, the, especially the adults, to the church school. And Lincoln School was built on um, Cornell Walnut and Spring. And it had one teacher. And it went to the eighth grade, first or eighth grade. And the lower grades were in one room, and the, and the other, and the older grades were in the other. There were no windows. So they couldn't look outside for some reason. Uh, the parents, the, the parents were upset because they had a white teacher, and they seemed to be their goals were the same, but they had no say in um, any part of the education. So the, the school council decided they wouldn't listen to them. The segregation went so deep that. When they graduated from Lincoln, the graduation ceremony was held at the AME church. You know, the, the, uh, 
with the school superintendent who come down there, and then the principal, and a couple of other organizations, but it was mainly a church, held at the church. And we have a, we happen to have a program, Salvage from Miracles, and it has one of the Paris brothers, it has my great great aunt, and my, and my grandmother. But she was in the fourth grade, and she got to sing a so got to sing a song. It was like, but the, the songs they were having them sing were like degrading, you know, Negro spirituals, how to be a good, you know, how to be a good darky, whatever, you know, things like that. So the parents were super sick. So the parents uh, finally had a meeting where they listened to what, to what their demands were and how their children weren't being educated on the same level because they kept failing when they went to the high school. A uh, grade grade graduation, you could go to high school, but that was integrated to a point. They did not want, it was bad enough they had to go, they said it's bad enough we have to go to school with them, but we don't want them at our graduation ceremonies. So there was a big fight in the paper. The Democrats were making fun of the Republicans because, oh no, you love, you love the coverage. So why don't you want to PS, PS the party with them? And so, you know, it, and the girls finally came up and said, we don't want in, you know, not nice words at all, probably. That was the headline in the newspaper. So eventually, the graduation went on, but there was a separate party held for the, the colored gentleman in our class. So, it really wasn't very well built. They had a colored, uh, policeman who was the, uh, I, he lived across the street from the Lincoln and he did repairs and he also did the discipline. Because in, in order, because the, the belief was the more you beat on the black kids, the, the more they would learn and learn, and learn how to behave. Until eventually it, the, it was, the parents started withdrawing their kids because there was a house of ill repute across the street that would be doing business with during school hours and their children could see what was going on but the town leaders you know, so yes <clears throat> and from what we can tell there was no trans there was no follow-up to make sure that the colored children went to school you know so uh, and by the time I, oh, yes, later on. Yeah. I was going to talk about that class. So that would be the uh, 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 schedule system. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, around the 1900s, the building was in disrepair, and you know, the kids weren't going. Um, they couldn't keep teachers. Uh, the ones they had were bad, they were, were abusing the children. So eventually, they uh, closed it on 1947. No, the first one. Yeah, they closed 20, 1920. 1920. And built the Lincoln School where it is now in East End. And uh, meanwhile, they built a lean-to building out of 10, corrugated 10, for the colored students to attend until the school was ready. Meanwhile, they revamped, put windows in the old Lincoln School, electricity, all that, and opened it for the white children. In order to, in order to get to the East End, any North End colored students had to take a bus from the Horace Mann from the old Lincoln School to go to the colored school. All right, so as Vicki said, this has been a hot mess to try to research. We have found um, 
Of the 47 years Lincoln School existed, we have found three attendance books, and we've been able to work from that. As Vicki said, prior to the Civil War, the education of black children was either covert, non-existent, or occurred hopefully in an organized setting once they came north, although even that was kind of scary. In 1816, Indiana says, quote, it shall be the duty of the General Assembly, as soon as circumstances will permit, to provide by law for a general system of education, ascending in a regular graduation from the township schools to a state university, where tuition shall be gratis and equally open to all, except blacks. And with that became this separate and unequal nonsense. By 1852, a new school-free law was inaugurated by our legislators, Again, excluding black and mulatto children. But basically it said, okay, you've got to educate the black kids. And if there aren't many of them, you can bring them into your schools. But if you have a bunch of them, just build them a different school. So that's what most communities did. And that's what Crawfordsville did. And that's when, as Vicki said, the AME Church stepped in. The Amy Church was built in 1847. By 1850, according to records, Vicki and Martha Cantrell, God rest her soul, were able to find, we think about 1850, this was the school that they built. It was built to accommodate between 26 to 28 students. By the time it was closed down, it was accommodating 146 in shifts. Oh, yes. And then on the weekend, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no, no. No, they were in shifts. And then on the weekends, the parents would come in because the parents were trying to just provide a home and food on the table. So it was sporadic, but at least it was something. At least you could get this, the kids to read so that in case they were uh, given a document that they didn't understand, well, they could then say, well, I can read this and there's no way I'm signing it. All right, so after the AME went to burst, the Center Presbyterian, now Wabash Presbyterian Church, stepped in. The church itself was created by a bunch of Wabash professors. James Thompson was the first one. He created, he, they broke away. You had the Old Light Presbyterians and the New Light Presbyterians. The Old Light Presbyterians believed in slavery or colonization or just shipping the blacks back to Africa. The New Lights took a much more advanced, enlightened point of view and so when AME was overrun with children wanting to learn, the New Lights, the Center Presbyterian Church, Wabash, Joseph Tuttle people said, you know what, you can rent our basement. We have looked and looked and looked for some kind of rental agreement to see what money was exchanged between the two because the school corporation had to pay for it because they were responsible for educating all children. But we, Crawfordsville schools only goes back to 1900 in their records. Believe me, Andrew, Andrew Nicodemus dug and dug and dug and dug and dug, and we, we, we can't find them. So this is Lincoln Building 1. If you know where Valentino's is, was, across from Walmart, I'm sorry, Walgreen, my apologies, that's where that building stood. Delhi found this in a 1891 newspaper. I'm sitting at my computer and an email comes in, oh, look what I found. And you're not screaming? I was over, I sent it to her, I'm like, you're not gonna believe this. But this, we think, is the earliest 1891 building. Now, that building had been built in 1881 in response to a growing black population in Montgomery County. And Montgomery County, or Carversville Schools, didn't want to integrate, or their version of integration, which included the blacks on the basement and the whites everywhere else. Can't make that up, we found that in the newspaper. So they built Lincoln One, had four rooms. And as Vicki said, most of the original teachers were white. And the black people finally said, wait a minute, why do we not have black teachers? We know they're out there, we know they're qualified. Well, it just so happened that these white teachers were local. If you're familiar with Bill Green, he, uh, who's an attorney, was, did he retire? Bill Green retire? I, I, I don't think so, not yet. Okay, if he's still practicing, his great-grandmother was one of the teachers, Lillian Perry. She lived at 1208 Wabash, we'll tell you about her later on down the road. But she was one of them and often had 60 students from grades one through six and or grades one through eight. There was no such thing as kindergarten at that point. Right. 
And so here she was, and it got to the point where she would have to teach half of them in the morning and maybe half of them in the afternoon if the kids came to school. But as a black kid in Crawfordsville, your incentive wasn't terribly high, as Vicki pointed out. A lot of kids never went to school. And or they'd show up and then a week or two and then they might they have to go, go to work, work to support their family. They had to go to work. So yeah, it was it was a no-win situation. But this school eventually became Horace Mann. If any of you are familiar with Horace Mann and or went to Horace Mann. So they closed this in the 1920s, we think. We're not 100% sure. They turned it into Horace Mann and then they tore Horace Mann down in the 1960s. And I think it was, it was <laughs> right. But they had a hard time tearing it down. My dad went to school there it's right after, he left, after they closed Lincoln, and he went to Horace Mann and for the 50th group. And when we were sitting there, and as I finished tearing, it was like 1960 or so, we were sitting there and, and uh, they were tearing up the rest of the trees and, and whatnot, and uh, we found some papers. What did dad's report card? <laughs> and he had been in the tree. <laughs> and we talked just looked to see his name and that D minus. <laughs> he said, those people should have burned it all that. I said, but you hid it from them. So they couldn't destroy it, you know. But that's just an aside. You know, because the house we grew up in couldn't find out it used to be the living house for the teachers, for the cooks. And I lived there all those years and never knew this. That was very big, you know. All the time, live right there in my house. And some of the teachers, the principal, principal lived there, this during with them one. And like five years ago, as the, the house was being torn down, uh, the person that bought the house brought me letters that she found in the chimney, in the basement. They were behind a brick. Five or six letters from 1906 to Addressed to different people, not the same. Person. Hmm. Why? Hmm. You know, Why? what did that say? Right. It's different. I know. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. Yeah, well, we'll talk about those fun letters that we attempted to transcribe. And mm, they told some stories. Okay, so moving on, Lincoln <laughs> One did its purpose until the 1920s. Uh, all the information is there. Uh, it, originally, we had 42 students with one teacher that eventually blossomed to 60. So, Lincoln One does its thing, but the black population shifts then from the north end, up by Bethel, to the east end, which, uh, because of jobs. The factories were built there. Mid-States was there. Uh, California Pellet Mill and its predecessors were there. So rather than having to drive somewhere to work, the black community built a community of its own on Beach Street, which is just west of what was the old Mid-States building, which is now Walden. Very thriving community. Oh, yeah. And Lincoln Two was built right across the street. Lincoln Two was built with no windows in the front, but a beautiful, open, giant windows in the back. And it depends on who you ask as to why that was, but I'm thinking we can probably all understand why there were no windows in the front and they were all in the back. The Lincoln Two building, after the Tin building, became the community bonding place for the blacks in our community. Because the Second Baptist, uh, the Second Baptist Church met there. The, yes. The, when their building was there, uh, the black uh, judges. Masonic, Masonic, uh, Good Odd Fellows, uh, Council of Ruth, those groups met there too. And any, and uh, it was an active recreation center. Mm -hmm. Very active. You know, like that. So, show movies and uh, have, held dances once in a while for the black community. Frances Wooden, if you're familiar with that name, her park was just redone. Frances Wooden intermittently worked there as well as the Northside Rec, which is on the site where her park is now. So Lincoln to my favorite stories, and I'm prying them out of her as time goes by. Lincoln to became the corner. And this was the place to go if you needed to know anything, if you wanted to know anything, if you wanted to meet somebody. And it was for blacks primarily. 
there were other individuals as well. And we think it was at the South Pine Street and the East Wabash intersection. Oh, yeah. And you you had areas where the kids met, you had areas where the old women met and gossiped and kept track of the kids. You had areas where the men would go play basketball and you better know how to play basketball or don't show up. For us that lived in the North End, yeah. uh, when dad would send me out to say, why not, what's going on? That's the only time I didn't have to beg for the car. You know, okay, dad, I'll go check see what happened Saturday night. You went to jail with that drug, you know, and whatnot. And, but it was a community, you know, the kids, whenever somebody passed from the family, they would all show up, you know, with food, you know, let's stay, you know, um, so the, the way the family that was grieving didn't have to do anything. And that was amazing when they would just, one phone call and then, you know, issue from the church ladies would get together and it was a community. And, um, that's what we miss now. That we, don't, that we want to make sure that we remember this. So, um, if you happen to know somebody from that era, my husband apparently actually went a couple times as a man to play basketball. Yeah. But um, you needed to be invited. If you were white, you needed to be invited by someone who was either black or connected in some way. And what they're going to do in this renovation for this Lincoln to is recognize the corner and what it represented for the black community at the time. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to know somebody from the 60s and 70s who was in high school and or in the area, ask him about that. Yeah, it was a uh, Sunday afternoon, that's where the guys went to play the basketball. And um, that's where the Wabash students, especially the black ones, would come on Sunday afternoons to interact mm -hmm. to meet. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm trying. I'm what he said. Yes, he was. He wasn't good. He didn't know that's what he said. Yes. He wasn't? Yes, so I ended up marrying him. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I, I was, he was on Meredith County, you know, from Wabash. He didn't know that there were no girls in Wabash. His parents didn't tell him to the guy. He said, I said, where are the girls? He said, 30 miles that way. 30 miles that way. <laughs> and, <laughs> but you know, full ride back then was something you didn't turn down. But, yeah, so, we, so we ended up, you know, getting married and whatnot. But we have, between Wabash and, and uh, the black community, we had Halloween parties and, you know, they had uh, tutoring for kids. So we wanted to try to get that for you too. So the big picture here and in closing is this. This was not a smooth thing that happened. There are lots of newspaper articles we found that really hurt my heart. And I would call her when I would find them and say, this is what these newspaper articles said, what do you do with it? She said, you're gonna publish it. Well, that was my thought, but yet I wasn't being the one, my ethnic background was not being slurred a great deal in both of our newspapers at the time. So we found that there was a lot of dissent, there was a lot of anger. The Crawfordsville school system basically ignored the, the black parents' request for a black teacher, less students, more teacher to student time, a, a smaller student to teacher ratio. They did eventually bring in black teachers who were amazing. One was the first, it was a 1904 Olympian, uh, George Thompson, and he was the first black athlete in Indiana, Indiana University. We had a Wabash graduate, John Evans. Let me tell you about those. He was the principal. He was the principal as well as the teacher. So eventually, it, but it was not a smooth transition. And when Lincoln Building went down in 81, or in, in 1950, back up. Lincoln II closed in 1947, 1950, the city bought it as part of the Parks and Rec, and they finally then tore it down in 1981. And it basically was basketball courts and green space for years and years and years. And just here recently, 
uh, we were part of, of the discussion on what to do with it because it needed to be honored and recognized for it what it gone. was <laughs> yeah, before everything was gone. Um, and so we're hoping that this brings more of a conversation back, that we hope that maybe if nothing else, and we wrote the book as a conversation starter. And the fact that as you read it and read the dissent and the anger and the hatred and the, the things that sound awfully familiar to what we hear now out of politicians and others' mouths, it is, we're almost going backwards in our acceptance of other people. But the, the Lincoln story, it's not finished being told. Delhi will every now and again find a treasure and or we get pictures like there's one that's hanging in the Carnegie that shows mid-states that shows Lincoln School and the thriving community across the street. So it's not, a t it, the story's not done. The story's not told. No, I'm not writing version two. Somebody else can do that. <laughs> but at least we now know that it's being, because it was the only school in Crawford's little school district without a history attached to it until we well, I, I know it's history, though. Yeah. I know it's history, but it didn't. It was there. I went to Leadership Academy with uh, Tamara. And part of the, what they did, it was like 2002. And part of it was we toured to kind of see what, you know, the local history, you know, just to be proud of it. We went to the normal school. And I saw those pictures of you know, those old classes. I said, where's ours? I know we, but we didn't just appear like mushrooms and whatnot. Where, where's our history? You know? And so I went back to the bus and was in tears because it, nobody was telling our story. So Tam came, came to me and asked me what was wrong. And I told her, and she said, I will show you how to, how to be kind of your words and tell your people's story. So at the book signing, she was in tears, not in tears. <coughs> they were good tears. Because it, it, she kept it, it wasn't a smooth road, but she kept it. And as I was sitting there signing the book, someone said, do you recognize me? And I looked up, it was my kindergarten teacher. And it's gone. If you're familiar with I, that. I knew it was Miss Lockhart. <laughs> I was the only black, little colored girl in the class at kindergarten. I thought my mother was going to leave me there until I turned white. I was scared <laughs> to death. I cried and cried. Miss Lockhart called me down and explained that my mom was coming back. And this is a fun place. And with learning, I could do anything. And that's, I spent my life learning. And the fact that this woman came back and she I said, I read her and I said, you saved me. You saved me. And she said, she had no idea. And I don't know if I scared her or whatever, but she was, there were tears in both of our eyes because all the name calling and stuff I went through and all the, her words and you, you can learn and you're, you're going to make it. So yeah, so this this book has been a journey. Sometimes I had to stop. Because of the, it, the empathy with my ancestors and what they went through, just because of, you know, they wanted to learn and the hardship they went through. So whenever I went to give, I went back to school. In fact, we got two degrees after I, uh, Perfect. Like I said, if they can learn about to, I was going, I, my husband died and my boy died. But that's going to school and learning. Miss Lockhart, she said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just want to share. We're, yeah. still, we're still tracking down. To this day, we are still tracking down 
graduates, and we eventually would like to tell all the graduate stories. We think that's probably a bit of a lofty goal, because we'll never find them all, we know that, and some attended some days, and some attend, didn't attend at all, but it's it's time that, that we did. So again, this is just a starting point. This is what we hope is a, an adventure that will continue. Very good, do you have a question? Yes. Any questions? Teaching, <clears throat> teaching blacks to read was illegal mm -hmm. in the South or Civil War era. Mm -hmm. Did any of that carry over into Indiana? Mm -hmm. If you look at Indiana and during the Civil War and prior, we were about half Union, half Rebel. Yeah. And so, yeah, and there were several schools. Uh, the American Missionary Society came up north into Southern Indiana and a lot of those schools got burned down by the whites who didn't think that that was appropriate. Um, there was a loss of life, there was a loss of all of those materials, because all the materials in black schools were handy downs. And the roof may or may not have leaked. Uh, there may or may not have been running safe water. There may have been a well in the back. There may have been an outhouse. You just, the, the, the disadvantages were just overwhelming. And so, yes, the answer to your question is, yeah, came up. Like in the South, I mean, do you get made? You know, um, Matt Turner. Mm -hmm. He was so afraid of the slave rebellion. The slave were. Yes. It it should have been. Been. Reading is not, you know, it, if you read, you can acknowledge it. Reading is knowledge. You're far away. Yep. My other question was, that was at Wilson, mm -hmm. about 1954, and there was one black person in the class. Where did those black students go when they were integrated? You want to take this one? They were either working or not in school. This was second grade. That doesn't matter. I don't think many of them were working. Yo, oh, you'd be surprised. We found some kids who had to go to work as early as kindergarten. My dad was, um, he kept his uh, grandmother, she was the neighborhood uh, medicine woman. So he kept her uh, with a baby at four. Went to the nursing home, visited his brother, and the lady that he helped recognized him for the stripper they said. You helped me get with my youngest kid. He said, Yeah, Fred. She said, What's that kind of name? He said, Fred. Oh, he's who helped. He said, and he, uh, he did sit pens at nine at the bumping alley, getting a pen. Uh, hosed down the, uh, at the slaughterhouse at six. So, you know, they were working. And, and it wasn't, in some situations, they went back to Bethel. Bethel was still hosting yeah. classes. So, a lot of the them church, the new church was built, yes. Uh -huh. So, well, the one black kid in class was a woman. Okay. I wonder who it was. 54. 54. Jimmy went. Jimmy went. Jimmy went. Yep. <clears throat> so, your question is well taken. And even today, we got a lot of kids who don't show up. And, you know, now we've got officers who go after them because of truancy. But even back then, black kid didn't show up. Yeah. And that's why one of the one of the things they tried to do in both of these Lincoln schools was take Lincoln School back and give it to the whites, and then they were going to tear down Bethel and build the black school where Bethel now stands. And the, the community members were like, mm, no, 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 no. Henry Campbell, Civil War general, got involved in that one and said, no, 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 that's not going to happen. So it's not that probably they didn't want to but they probably didn't feel comfortable. We've got a lot of those stories, especially if you went for, to, at, to Lincoln for grades one through eight, and then you were dropped in the high school. Oh, there you go, survive. Because, if you, because of the intermittent way they learned, like this, some of them would skip a grade, and so they didn't learn how to print, but they were in the cursor. So they could write the cursor and read cursor, but they couldn't put the name. Frances Wooden, who uh, the park is named after, that's what happened to her. She was skipped a grade because she was so smart for Lincoln, but yet when she got to the high school, she struggled. 
and it, you got 60 kids and one teacher. Eventually they did get two teachers, a male and a female, but that was well into the history. That was at least two. When they the were teachers at the were, at, were at, Oh, that's right, they were. The teachers yes. were at one. So yeah, we, uh, we, we have a lot more to do. Yeah, and discovery more, you know, people, yes. more people, of course, once the book comes out, they never actually, you know, there's a lot of people can store it, so. We had a hard time getting people to go on tape, to be, to be uh, audio taped. Um, a lot of people would give us the nice fluff, what we thought, what they thought we wanted to hear. But then, for example, Ronnie Goodwin said, shut that tape recorder off and I'll tell you what it was really like. And so we know, and, and the, the, one of the ladies, I had the, the absolute honor and pleasure of interviewing Patty Hines. I told her, I said, I don't want you to give me what you think this white face needs to hear. I want you to tell me what it was really like. And for an hour and a half, she talked. And I, there were a couple of times where it was hard to hear. It was really, it was hard to hear. But without that, I could not have moved forward with, with the next phase of the book. So, any other questions? I know we're well over time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Okay, as a new resident, um, how does Lincoln Park tie into this? We live like right near the pellet mill and Lincoln Park and all. Lincoln Park is where Lincoln 2 stood. Okay. From 1922-ish, right before the Depression, until 1947. Okay. And then in 47, they closed it because at that point, desegregation was defined. There were only nine people on the goal of school. Nonsense. Which of course it wasn't defunct, but there were only nine, and, and Carpenter School just couldn't afford that. Uh -huh. So then they sold it to the Park and Rec, and they took it down in '81. Mm -hmm. And it has been a green space since then with basketball courts. So it, it's over 100 years old, the site. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of controversy in this area. Yeah, a lot of controversy. The Atlas is the new bad. Oh, the Atlas, we weren't done with it. The Black Street. No. And we're and, and then we talked about the need for tennis court. and. <laughs> and pickleball courts. Now they're putting pickleball yeah, courts. They're, they're, like, they're putting pickleball okay. courts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had a question. I heard something about there's going to be a new marker in 2025. Yes. Yes. Do you know what time period or anything? Well, yes. We applied for a marker last year thinking that we could get our feet wet and see what we'd have to do to edit what got accepted on the first year. Mm -hmm. And I thank Diane for that because with Mary Holloway World Height thing and I used a lot of her work. Um, but yes, it was accepted. It was going to be installed this May until they started bringing bulldozers. So I called Casey Pfeiffer and I said, can we put this off? Because if a bulldozer hits that, I'm going to hit the bulldozer. <laughs> and so it's now going to be May of 2025. Our, our, our application was accepted. I've already gotten one grant. I've applied for two others. And then along with that, we're going to, we've created what's called the Soul Stroll, where we're going to go through some of the more prominent areas of the black community, and then we'll have a soul food extravaganza. <coughs> so we all know that's, that's, that's coming on around Juneteenth. Yeah. So we, we've gotten some we've got some grants out from that. After January 21st, it's either going to be feast or famine in Shannon Hudson's world. Either it's going to be I'm rolling in the dough, grant money, or I'm going to be so devastated and depressed that I'm going to have to go write some more grants. So stay tuned. January 21st. Well, I know sometimes for like highway markers and different things, sometimes they have to have a donation to help. Awesome. We do, but I'm hoping I can grant it. Okay. That's um, the book sales. Yeah, the book sales that are at the Carnegie, the money that it's Carnegie right now, whatever I don't have <coughs> grant at the Carnegie, we'll use our book sales to pay for them. And then whatever we don't have, whatever we don't use, goes straight to the Bethel. So Vicki and I don't get any money for this. Michelle O. and I wrote an article for the library for a preview shelf in the paper. And it was supposed to come out Sunday. Well, it did not. It was about the book. And it's about the monument and different things. So that's why I was asking. So if someone asked me, I have a little bit. Yep. Of May twenty May twenty twenty five is right now. Fingers crossed. Her dad will be back in the states. Her dad it's is a graduate of Lincoln too, and so we'll have him back in the states, and we'll have others as yeah. well. So my dad's getting married. <laughs> <laughs> that was your Christmas song. Yes, sir. 
Uh, do you happen to know at what point um, were black or colored students allowed to go to uh, Wabash College? Oh, have we got a story for you. 1857, a black kid named John Blackburn just found out, I believe what Tim, Dr. Tim Lake at Wabash has done all the research, finally found a young man's name. He attempted, was run out of town after two weeks. Yeah. 18, so 1857 was not a good year for this. Uh, what are we thinking, 30s, 40s? Or was it later? What? It was after desegregation when a black kid got into Wabash. That was, uh, that was wasn't that Evans? No, he was the first graduate. He was the first to graduate. 1905, John Evans, who was a principal of Lincoln One, 1905 to 1908. He went on Saturdays. He went on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So he graduated in 1908, but he wasn't a formal student. He went on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> well, ninth, I guess 1908 would be, no, 1905, 1908, somewhere around there. That would probably be the first, but actually formalized, living in the dorms, living on campus, going to school full time. I don't have a clue. I think Beth had articles and research on that. She may have. We can call Nolan and Eller and find out. But it was a while. Okay. It was it was a while. Yeah, 1857 did not roll. But in fact Tim Lake and his cohorts at Wabash are bringing in John Blackburn's family, a student from Wabash who got run out of town. They'll be here February 5th and 6th, and they're going to hopefully have some closure to the story.